So really pleased to be here tonight. I, I, I have to lead with the disclosure that um, any opinions that I express are mine and mine only, not J.P. Morgan Chase's, so for the record. Um, it, and, you know, uh, this topic, um, these guys are going to get tired. They're, they're tired of hearing this, but there, there's a couple catalysts in my mind that, that uh, were the genesis of wanting to learn more about this space and uh, to organize the, the, uh, the event tonight on this topic. First of all, my son was in high school five or six years ago uh, playing Madden. My wife comes to me and says, you know, I've asked him three times. He's got homework. Can you go drop the hammer? Because something's got to be done. So I walk in the room and I'm like, Julian, you know, come on. You've been, your mom's asked you. You're, you know, you've got homework to do. And then I looked at the screen and I saw the quality of the, the images in, in Madden in the game, and it was almost like watching a real game. So I found myself sort of looking at the coverages and going, no, 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 they're too deep here. you got to run the skinny post and, get, and getting into the game. And at that point, I sort of realized that I, I understood the, the notion of sort of being a passive spectator of a, of a, a knee game, right? Um, you know, fast forward down the road five years later, I see, I'm reading stories about Robert Kraft investing. Robert Kraft, for those of you who don't know, is the owner of the New England Patriots. Uh, Magic Johnson, Alex Rodriguez, you know, people from the, the, uh, uh, the analog sports world, if you will, um, you know, investing in the space. So um, on, on, with that as a backdrop, I'd um, like to thank Andrew Tosh, uh, Jen McLean, and Alex Chamblin for, join, Champlin for, for joining us tonight and really look forward to, uh, to their discussion. I, I think we're going to flow through uh, sort of a historical backdrop on the growth of esports and a discussion of esports as a media vehicle, the impact of esports on game development, um, and also the investment environment, including trends in China where this phenomenon is substantially larger than what we're experiencing here in the U.S. that could translate to future opportunities here. And a discussion of a recent capital raise uh, by Jen and the experience of uh, ReadyUp, um, what resonated with investors in, in, in that scenario. So with that, i uh, also like to queue up a video that sort of sets the tone in terms of the enthusiasm and the energy that's in this space. Um, hope you enjoy the evening. And Your defending champions, SK Telecom T1. Goes right by it, but who he level one, bro? Right down, break it's hit. Yes, it is the Rome. CLG coming together, showing up on the world stage. And they have the damage to get it done. This is going to be the year when wildcard teams became ideal. I think, yes. This time we are not just winning. We are looking better than our opponents. This is going to be it! San Francisco is going crazy! Brazil scored the biggest goal of the tournament so far! And the greatest time! All these minions are hitting the point. Like, Clifford, go! He's in fire! Yes, they failed. Yes, they could do better. But, but, when they had nothing, they have shown their competitive spirit and they fought until the very end. A little bit too low in this one. He's just, he's, he's done, done it. for one. The steal away. Yeah, it goes to Kears. They absolutely massive yeah. out of tricks. And EDG are evaporating. And it looks like H2K will seal the deal. Your first seed from Group C. No. 得到这个机会，对一个职业选手来说是很开心的一件事情。This is our big shot. This is TSN's big shot. Good flash of Bjergsen. Still gets recovery. Man, rock up. TSN are getting destroyed. They're hurt. They're grieved. They're done. Royal and Fox to Chicago.
언니 팬들에게 미안하지만 저희도 <웃음> 이기려고 여기 왔고. Like 유럽의 시스템 중에 저희밖에 안 남았는데 그래도 한 끝까지 살아남아서 유럽을 자랑스럽게 하고 싶어요. He hops over the minions, sidesteps the deadly flourish. MLX G is looking for the kill. Sonic Wave connects. Resonation strike. This might just survive. Mega Man's coming up. The boomerang. The excitement. The hyper. You survive. SK Telecom advance to the semi-final of Worlds. He is still chasing on the death. Who's nearly out of HP? The chase in for Bray. First blood. F2 for Peter. It might be a third. It's going to be the rematch of Worlds last year. Rock hoping to get revenge on SK Telecom T1, hoping to win a world championship. No flash. Oh, never mind. We got more action. Ryu's in so much trouble. Pounce is slashed away from, but Ambition gets one. Diddly showing off for cutting again. Now Ryu has to summon us. Ryu's dead, no doubt about it. Number one, you gave crown victor. And ambition, he's got something to prove. A 3-0 sweep of Europe's H2K will send Samsung Galaxy to the world final. Kryptonite, 뭐 그런 정도까지는 솔직히 느끼지 않고요. 어, 충분히 이길 수 있는 상대라고 항상 생각해 왔고 지금도 그렇게 생각하고 있어. There's the harpoon, there's the chase down, and Gorilla's gonna make it rain. And the bullet time, and it's gonna be all the damage he needs. Gorilla getting the kill. Rox Tigers, one game away from breaking the curse. How has Banky been able to trade his Nidalee? He's not known as a Nidalee player. They're confident first picking it in what could be an elimination game in Worlds. They're going for Kuro. Double bomb on a Kuro. Jamal's gonna land this time, and he's gonna get the damage. Yes, he is. First blood in for Baker. He's out. The flash of Kuro, the stun, and the Baker not gonna matter. Bangy. Bangy. And Bangy again. SKT fight their way back in the elimination game. Bangy sucks back, and he saves SKT. Now we're going to game five. Two Korean heavyweights in the fight of the millennium. 제가 스맵 선수한테 1등 자리를 뺏겨서 아쉬움이 많이 컸고 이번 월드 챔피언십에서 다시 1등을 하자라는 생각을 많이 했고 really know what to expect from this Samsung team. Yes, they crushed the bracket stage, but they haven't played a team as close to as good as SKT here. Might have some kill try. Oh, oh, oh. Is still getting oh. the last tick. He's on ground. Solo kills Faker. Side steps away. Bengi's running in. Oh. Oh. Kill. And that's the type of defeat you don't want to have if you're Samsung, because this is the momentum building of SKT's war machine. It looks oh, like Samsung go! are coming back! They've killed Faker! Found Beggy! And moving on to Duke! Fourth oh, and he's killed! The fatal deck that ambition shows! Ambition! Ambition steals the Elder Dragon! Very good title here. Oh, yeah. yeah. Duke, he's found three! Oh. Charges up the Maelstrom! The slingshot! Faker's down! Samsung get three! Play the silver!
for scrapes. Samsung and SKT are going to game five. Duke flashes forward, chomps down to kill Crown. SK Telecom have got two, make that three kills. SK Telecom have overcome every challenge. They are the undisputed best team in the world. The SKT reign continues. They win their third world championship. That was uh, excerpts from the 2016 League of Legends Championships. Um, so I wanted to, for those of you who haven't seen the enthusiasm and sort of the, the, the appeal, I wanted to set the tone with that. Um, Alex? All right. All right. That's fantastic. That's a really, really fantastic segue. I think I'll spend a little time. So I'm, I'm Alex Champlin. I'm a, a grad student at UCSB. Um, and so I'm going to kind of talk through the, uh, the, the historical context for, for eSports and kind of get us from uh, 1997, 98, where the, sort of the, the model that we're, we're looking at today kind of, kind of originates, um, up to the, the current moment. Um, I can actually click through to my uh, next slide. So, um, so I got into this um, kind of around 2010. Um, so in 2010, I, I graduated from college, um, and it was kind of in the middle of this, uh, you know, this big economic recession. And so, uh, so I had all these friends that were really fascinated with, with video games and with esports and, and were kind of investing in these things as a, as a potential um, career goal. And that was kind of when it clicked for me that this was like you know, a, a phenomenon that would you know, be, be my generation's thing. Um, so, so that's where I come to this. But uh, the history of, of spectator video games um, is a little bit longer than that. And so, you know, video games, because as a technology, have kind of always been spectatable. Um, you know, the, sort of the, the arcade cabinets from the, the 70s and 80s are designed so that multiple people can kind of look at them and, and see what's going on. Um, and even through um, through the 70s and 80s, you had this kind of this this interest in turning video games into some other kind of media commodity. And so you had things like um, the Nintendo World Championship or a, a Space Invaders Championship. Um, and, and the difference between, between this kind of media and the eSports e that we're talking about today um, really has to do with the, the, the focus on, uh, on a spectator and kind of producing this, um, this, this kind of fandom, the way, the way you would you know, find in a, in a sport or something like that. Um, and so Korea in the, in the late 90s and early 2000s really... Um, Really, kind of pioneers what we're um, what we're talking about today. And so, um, what I'm going to kind of talk through is a, uh, a a cultural or economic kind of context for this emergence, and then kind of talk about the platforms and the technologies that um, that gave rise to the the kind of crystallized media commodity that we think of as as esports. Um, because I think it, it, um, it has a lot to say about the current moment as well. Um, so 1997 saw this um, major sort of financial meltdown in, um, in Asia. South Korea was, was one of the countries that was particularly, um, particularly strongly hit by that. And so this kind of created this, this economic context where you had um, a lot of young men out of work. Um, and so this is one of the sort of the, the cornerstones of, of esports emergence. Um, Korea also had a, um, a much newer telecoms infrastructure. And so if you, you think of our telecoms infrastructure, we've kind of been updating that from you know, the, the 50s. Um, Korea had, had built theirs much, much more recently. And so they've, they've kind of been ahead of us in terms of you know, just the, the broadband capabilities that regular people enjoy. So the other kind of foothold that esports needed was, um, was, was technological. You had to be able to connect a bunch of players and a bunch of computers together to, to compete virtually. Um, and so this is kind of the, the, the state of affairs in Korea as things are, are, are getting ready to heat up for esports. Um, in 1998, in the US, um, Blizzard Entertainment, who continues to be a, a pretty big player in the sort of in the esports thing, launches uh, first StarCraft and then a patch for the game um, Brood War. And um, this quickly sells uh, over a million copies in, um, 
in Korea, and Korea is not a not a very large com uh, country, so that's like I mean that's a, a pretty astounding um, statistic. But um, but Korea is also a, a very um, homogenous country from like a, from a, a cultural standpoint, um, and it's also a, a country where. Um, where a lot of people's leisure activities take place in, in things outside of the home. And so coffee shops become places for people to, uh, to get together. And um, at, the, at the time, Korea had this, um, this internet cafe infrastructure. And it was kind of designed so that people who didn't have home computers could, you know, could rent a space or rent a computer and rent access to the internet. And so in, in the middle of a sort of a financial crisis, this became a, a space for young men um, which is kind of the sort of the, the core demographic for esports in, in Korea, um, to sort of to, to gather and send out resumes and sort of figure their futures out, but also to, uh, to play video games. And so kind of overnight, uh, StarCraft became this, uh, this esports sensation in Korea. Um, and people were playing it in these network spaces um, with their friends, and, um, and it kind of grew to this, this point of being a, a national phenomenon. Um, so a year later, um, this Korean cable TV network um, on, um, on, I think on tunes, um, in a sort of, in a, um, in a kind of like test of, of esports programming, um, broadcast this one competition between two high-ranked Korean video game competitors. Um, and the thing was a smash hit. Um, and so very quickly this kind of turned from a, you know, like a one-off TV program into um, a, a cable channel kind of designed entirely to, um, you know, to, to broadcast esports. Um, and so this is another kind of crucial difference between the context that I'm going to kind of pivot to talk about in a second, um, and the, the Korean context is that um, Korea had this cable infrastructure that was, again, kind of aimed at a much more um, culturally homogenous market um, and aimed at a, a real kind of like diverse set of, of interests. And so you had things like K-pop and you had, um, I was there for research and they have a, a, a TV channel dedicated to the, the board game Go. Um, and billiards and things like that. So it's a, um, I mean, if you, you imagine our cable market and just the sort of the, the number of options kind of exploded and diversified. I mean, that's what, what we were looking at in Korea. And so, um, so this was kind of this, this perfect petri dish for esports to emerge as a, a real cultural fascination. And so um, if you talk to people about esports today, the uh, the clip of, of League of Legends that we watched um, is is a game where this is the case. Korea continues to produce some of the the best esports athletes in the world, and and it's largely due to um, to this legacy. And it's you know it's it's this phenomenon that um, that's aged pretty well in Korea. So if you imagine a lot of you know young people in their twenties at the uh, at the turn of the century, you know by by 2018, we're looking at people who now have kids and who, who have kind of grown up on, on esports and have you know, grown into adults who are fans of esports. And, um, and it's, it's now this kind of this, this cultural thing that, um, that continues to produce these top E athletes. Um, and so in thinking about how this you know, kind of helps us understand the current moment, um, I've, I've tried to signal here these, these three things that I think make for... Um, for the kind of petri dish that you need for something like esports to emerge and for it to kind of succeed at, um, at a level that takes it beyond the space of land competitions or really sort of small scale niche, uh, niche media. So um, the first is infrastructure. And in the case of um, South Korea, you had, um, you had the sort of the, the proliferation of broadband, deeper internet penetration, um, and and PC bongs specifically, and so this meant that you know people had access to the game without necessarily having to to purchase their own copy. They could kind of go to the space and and you know play a pickup game of StarCraft or something like that. Um, socially or culturally, um, the kind of you know concentration that you have in a in a small country like Korea is different than trying to you know make esports happen for 
uh, for something as big as the U.S. or you know, or, or in a global scene. Um, the cable market and the, the large player base located in a in a single country also kind of helped you know crystallize that. And so this is what I'm going to be talking about going forward: is the kind of the the need to get to a, a tipping point or a saturation point to make esports kind of um, run. Um, and then the the economic market. So um, players at this time are looking at high, un high un unemployment, and we're also kind of representing a very narrow demographic. Um, so, you know, what I've talked about is kind of like the, uh, the late 90s to early 2000s, and then I'm going to jump basically a decade and kind of talk about the emergence of a, of a global esports scene. Um, the U.S. was slow to catch up, and so I said, like, you know, esports existed as um, as land tournaments and as um, as as competitions, but they didn't have the the reach of um, of Korean esports. And so, what what it took for for esports to kind of become the thing that we're here to talk about today um, was this um, was this shift in in platform and um, really the sort of the creation of uh, and clustering of a, of a market for um, for esports consumers, and so um, I'm going to talk about a couple of things. Um, I'm going to talk about um, a series of games that came out in the, uh, in the like 2010, 2012. Um, I'm going to talk about a series of platforms that kind of pushed, like you know, internet websites platforms that pushed esports into. Um, into the mainstream, um, and I'm, I'm also going to kind of talk about the uh, the social and cultural context for um, for, for this sort of current round of esports. So, um, in in 2010, um, Blizzard Entertainment released the follow up to uh, to StarCraft. They released StarCraft Two, uh, and this was kind of before global esports were um, you know were the, the thing that we're talking about today, but um, but they were kind of there was this hope around StarCraft II as this this text that would bring esports into the mainstream in the West, and so um, StarCraft II launched. And um, if you wanted to watch it, it had a, a fairly clunky interface. So you had to either download this um, this platform that lets you uh, let you stream games as they were played in Korea. You could watch as people were playing in Korea. Um, but it was very clunky, and you had to kind of be a, a fan of StarCraft already to know about that. And otherwise, things circulated on um, on platforms like Twitch, or, or sorry, on platforms like YouTube, and, and sort of a video on demand after the fact format. Um, in 2011, though, um, this this live streaming platform, Twitch, um, started to broadcast games content, and so um, so that's really the kind of the the catalyst for a lot of what we're, what we're talking about. You had this, uh, this platform where anybody could, you know, could sit down and play a video game for an audience and theoretically make a career or, um, or at least sort of make a, a side income doing this thing. And so you had all of these young people really fascinated with, with Twitch as a, as a possibility, as a sort of a space for, um, you know, for, for Producing fans or producing a name for themselves, and uh, and and this is kind of where where I want to come back to my uh, my fascination with this phenomenon. So um, in 2010, I I just graduated from from college and I was um, making the transition into grad school, um, and I had a bunch of friends who who were doing the same thing, but we were also, you know, we were kind of trying to figure out ways to make our our fascination with games. Uh, you know, more than just a, a kind of a, an activity that we did, you know, amongst ourselves. And so, um, so these platforms started to provide a way to see this sort of game fandom, game culture that, you know, we'd all been a part of in a, in a new light. You know, it produced these, these um, celebrities or these figures around, um, around the games that we liked. And um, it also produced a space where we could kind of come together and... Uh, you know, and, and watch the games that we were interested in. And so I was, at the time, fascinated with, um, with StarCraft and the game League of Legends. And uh, if you wanted to watch either of these competitively, you had, to, you had to tune into Twitch. Twitch kind of became this hub where 
fans of a whole, you know, a whole range of different games could come together and watch esports content relative to, um, to whatever their interest was. And so what this produced was the kind, of, uh, the kind of petri dish that you had in Korea, although now it's kind of it's dispersed over the internet and, uh, and you know, all of these different esports texts, potentially. But what it meant was that if I was a fan of StarCraft II, I would you know, be on Twitch and I might see something happening with CSGO, or I might see something happening um, with, uh, with a Call of Duty game, or with, uh, with something in the Halo series. And so all of a sudden you had um, this market that had existed in the US and existed in Europe kind of broadly, um, finding a, a hub, finding a place to, to kind of connect and congeal around, um, around esports. And so, uh, so it was a kind of a combination of people's familiarization with, uh, with streaming platforms and a kind of a, a comfortable, comfortable, you know, like, a, um, kind of a, a switch in your media diet towards, um, towards consuming things offline. So this is, you know, these are cord cutters, this is kind of a post cable, uh, market, and this is, this is kind of how eSports um, finds its foothold in, in a global sense. Um, it also, um, it also uh, coincided with the sort of the, um, the ubiquity of phones, um, that, that people's cell phones kind of became portals to, to watch Twitch. Um, it's also... Um, it's also kind of driven by a games market that was much more um, that, that was much more complete, um, or much more uh, sorry. Uh, that was more robust and also kind of kind of growing in a way that. Um, that was challenging other media, um, other sort of established media. Uh, and so what you had here was this, um, was this space where, where eSports could really kind of begin to, to grow out and, um, and, and develop into, you know, into to the kinds of franchises that we see with like the, the League of Legends promo or the Overwatch League. And so where, you know, where StarCraft and the sort of the Korean, the Korean esports phenomenon emerged out of this, um, out of this fascination with a, with a particular game, the, uh, the sort of the emergence of esports in the West depended on, um, on Twitch as a platform to sort of organize this content, but also depended on the sort of the health and maturity of the, of the game's market. And so um, what actually happened was, um, the developer for the game, League of Legends, um, and uh, a number of, of other games kind of followed suit, but what they did was kind of take a, um, a managing interest in eSports and sort of turning eSports from, um, from something that was largely community-driven um, and, and kind of a, a fan practice that existed in hotel conference rooms and things like that, and turned it into this, um, this media commodity that used Twitch as a kind of a a platform to to share and connect with with its audiences, um, and so the reason this worked for League of Legends uh, and for a number of esports that kind of followed suit was that these games were driven by um, by microtransaction economies, and so this is kind of the the point that I want to pivot to um, in the last oh that's big um, in the last part of this this presentation. Um, so esports are not TV sports, um, and the point I want to make is that you know the, the sort of the Korean dependence on on cable as a as a way to sort of to circulate and reach its audience isn't isn't necessarily the way that um, that esports circulate in in the kind of contemporary scene. Um, so esports are a kind of post TV media; um, they function. Really, through through an ability to um, to tap platforms and um, and and kind of t 
tap a user that's, um, that's kind of consuming games and interested in, um, uh, interested in, in, in media that's, you know, kind of, kind of post-television. Post um, so, I, I want to point out two statistics, and I'm going to kind of move into to a discussion of them. This is, um, Newsu does a lot of kind of data, data research for, um, for games markets, but they, they're producing a lot of stuff about esports and, um, and the sort of the, the emerging market around esports advertising, uh, esports as a kind of as a consumer product. Um, and so this is their graph, but, uh, but what I really want to kind of draw your attention to is this, um, this $906 million of, of revenue for esports um, projected for, for this year. Um, that's an astounding figure for a, for a new phenomenon, but um, this is the revenue for League of Legends, which is a free-to-play video game, um, which sounds kind of crazy, right? That, you know, this, this free-to-play video game is... Um, also, I should say, this is a, uh, almost a 10-year-old video game. So this is the game that you know, got me interested in this eSports thing. Um, so League of Legends s survives on this free-to-play free -play model, um, where, where players buy skins, buy characters, buy items in this game, rather than ever buying the, sort of the game as a core commodity. And so I, th I think this is where if we want to kind of differentiate esports from, from traditional sports or, um, or think about, you know, what kind of makes this, this thing unique, I think this is the kind of the, the statistic that we have to pay attention to. Oh, oh, that's rough. Um, so, uh, can we actually, if we exit full screen, does it not block that? At any rate, um, what this says is it's part of a platform economy. Um, and Twitch is, is a platform for eSports, but, um, but what you have to kind of think about when, you, you know, when you're, you're considering the, sort of the broader field here is that each of these games actually is a platform in their own right. Um, so when we're talking about eSports as a kind of a, a broad phenomenon, um, that's one thing. But each game as an eSports text is kind of its own, its own entity. And so some games will be you know, really successful and have these, you know, long 10-year lifespans as, as, you know, as these competitive scenes. And other games might be designed as esports and, you know, and, and not actually achieve something like that. Um, and so when you think about these, these things, you really have to kind of understand, that, understand them in terms, of, um, in terms of platforms and user bases. Um, and, and think about, okay, well, what are they getting, you know, getting users to do? Um, they've succeeded up until this point really as, um, as an industry that, that runs in parallel to the, to the booming games industry. Um, and so, so something like League of Legends, while a, a really impressive esports, it's, it's, um, it's also a really impressive video game and that it's, you know, it's, it's lasted for, for 10 years in a market where you know, an iteration of a game kind of lasts for, you know, a year or two before a sequel comes out. And so, um, what they've kind of perfected is this, um, is this product cycle. And eSports is, is, um, is situated in their sort of their model of, of, of marketing or, or producing um, League of Legends. The, uh, the, the recently launched Overwatch League has a sort of a similar, um, has a similar structure. So these are, um, these are major esports productions, but they they serve as a kind of um, sort of s synergistic or um, or kind of complementary, almost like a um, you know a, a leader to um, to their games markets. And so, in sort of in drawing this distinction between esports and and traditional sports, what I'm, what I want to signal is that. You really have to understand esports as a, a, a product of, or a, a 
um, a component of a broader sort of games market. And the sort of the largest esports games have a number of, of kind of crucial things in, in common. Um, they're, they're multiplayer, they have a competitive element. Um, most of them kind of condense competition into these 15 to 30 minute segments. Um, and some of the most successful ones are free to play. Um, so they don't charge users for, um, for subscriptions or, um, or for the sort of the base cost of a game, but instead they, um, they drive these sort of secondary markets around, um, around game content, essentially. Um, but this means that there is a lot of potential room for growth in esports. It means it's a, a fairly volatile industry. Um, you have um, a very sort of high turnover of, of games and franchises, and so StarCraft II, which kind of started this esports wave, uh, has really kind of slid, um, you know, slid down the esports charts as, uh, as things like League of Legends, um, and then Overwatch, and Counter-Strike. Um, kind of, Call of Duty has been this like perennial uh, esports presence, but, um, but there's a lot of turnover, and so esports as a thing seems to be this, you know, this really fascinating and, and you know, rapidly expanding uh, media industry, but, but game to game, you, you see all of these different kind of patterns of growth and different uh, practices of, of production. Um, so so there's, a, uh, there's a great deal of turnover, but, um, but it becomes predictable in the sense that players follow, um, follow trends. What, what you're looking for with esports is, you know, is that petri dish. You want a user base that's, um, that's robust and growing. And so um, to the extent that esports are, are sustaining the games that, you know, that, that they're featuring, uh, that's usually a good sign that... Uh, you know, that the game is healthy um, and that the eSport is healthy is this sort of this, the, the growth and, um, and loyalty of a player base. Um, I, hope, I always want to say something about demographics when I'm doing these presentations. Um, Twitch notes that its user base is, um, is roughly 80% male, um, and it says that like 50% of them are between the ages of 18 and 35. Uh, and you can kind of suspect that the you know this this the the other fifty percent skews towards the lower end of that spectrum. Um, so that means that there's a lot of room um, to uh, to attract women, to attract um, these sort of these young fans that will kind of grow and mature into um, into de dedicated esports esports players or fans. Um, esports. Games generally have high player bases, um, and you, you really want to kind of like, you know, um, well, I'll, I'll leave it to Jennifer who's going to talk about China, but, uh, but in Korea and in China, the, uh, the, the PC cafes have these sort of lists of what, you know, what players are, are, are choosing to play, um, and Twitch has this sort of this algorithm that, that sorts the games that it features. Um, and so these are usually pretty good marks of, you know, of what people are playing, what the sort of the, um, the, sort of the hot esports titles are. And I think that's a, you know, one way of kind of seeing the sort of the growth of this phenomenon. Um, and really, the, I mean, I've said this already, but these, um, up to this point, esports have been, have been designed to complement game economies. Um, and so, Thinking of them as their, their sort of their own standalone media industry, I think kind of misses the broader picture that you know these these sort of these large scale, very successful esports um, promotions like the uh, the League of Legends World Championship or the the Overwatch League in LA um, or the, uh, the the Dota International, which always sort of seems to set the record for the uh, for the largest esports prize pool, are um, are, are run by the uh, the license holders or the, um, the the publishers behind these games, and so there's um, there's this sort of deeply synergistic character that um, that really can't be extracted from the sort of the broader games market. Um, but it's also very young, um, you know. At 
you know, at, at less than 20 years old. Um, it's this, you know, this, this fascinating you know, media, media commodity that's really kind of deeply experimental, but, um, but experimenting with all these sort of these new ways of connecting to fans, of, of sort of existing outside of the, the traditional television infrastructure, um, of, leveraging, of leveraging platforms and sort of an oscillating between, um, between platforms and between sort of media modes. So, um, you know, I think there's a, a lot of really exciting room for, for growth and um, know, be a pretty neat 10, 10 years after this. All right, that's my presentation. All right. Uh, I did this presentation for my nine-year-old son before tonight, and I asked him what he thought, and he said, it's a little long. So I'll try to tighten it up for you on the fly here. Uh, okay, so my name's Andrew Tosh. Um, I've worked in, uh, as a software engineer in the video game industry for uh, like over 15 years. Um, and about 10 years ago, I started a company uh, called GameSim, uh, based out of Orlando, Florida, which is where I was living. Uh, and we provided uh, engineering outsource services for the video game industry. So we get hired by uh, the large publishers to help them with whatever they're doing. Sometimes small titles were due entirely, but usually um, helping with uh, mostly console games. Um, uh, we actually were, though, were acquired last year, uh, about a year ago, for, uh, by a large company called Keyword Studios, um, and they do outsource video game development, uh, all kinds of different things, art, engineering, localization, audio, uh, you name it. And so they acquired us, but we, we, we're still a, a separate studio. Um, I moved out here to Santa Barbara about uh, three plus years ago. Um, but what I want to talk today about is regarding esports and how esports is affecting development, uh, because that's the sort of area that, that I know in terms of what is the impact that it's having on publishers' decision making in terms of design, especially. So, first of all, uh, video game competitions are not a new thing. You had in the uh, early, mid-90s, a company called ID Software made some games that I'm sure everyone's heard of. Uh, Doom, Quake, Wolfenstein 3D. Th th these are um, really important games. A lot of people think of them as being revolutionary in terms of being the first first-person shooter, which they certainly are. Uh, but they also supported LAN. So LAN is a local area network. So just a, a network that's, think of this, not on the internet. Uh, but you, your computers can talk to each other that are on the same network. So back in the day with this, you would... Uh, have Doom on your machine and you know you pick up your computer and you bring it to your friend's house and you set up uh, uh, your own little LAN and you can play Doom against each other on your own computer. This was very new, right? Before this, the only multiplayer games were, you know, you're on the same computer or you're on the same console or on the same ar arcade machine. So th this was a new thing. And this is actually one of the early Quake competitions, uh, uh, you can see, and um, that Quake competition actually is still going on today. They kept that going uh, uh, for a long time. So eSports is emerging out of this. Uh, you have in the late 90s with the, the internet boom, um, it just gradually becomes uh, just a given that every game is going to have uh, online multiplayer support. Um, actually, a, a story for like about five years ago, um, a company called BioWare, um, which is owned by EA, is a studio uh, that contacted us, my company, about wanting some online engineers uh, to help them with Mass Effect 3. This was very confusing to me because uh, Mass Effect, if you know this series at all, is, is, was one and two were totally story-driven games. There was no online aspect at all. It was a campaign mode uh, uh, style game. Uh, but they contacted us about wanting online, so I was like, all right. Uh, so we added online. Was, Mass Effect 3 was the first that actually had multiplayer support. They got a lot of pushback from the uh, hardcore fan base about not wanting multiplayer that it was a story, but... It worked from our perspective, and we got paid, so we were happy. But uh, uh, it, it just happens that now it's just moving that all games are adding some level of, of, of multiplayer support. You have on top of this uh, streaming exploding, right? So we, we just heard from Alex talking about how much Twitch is going crazy, and uh, you know, Sony's got their own platform and so on, uh, where it becomes fun to be a spectator, to watch uh, maybe your, your friends play a game at a competition, or maybe to watch somebody that's incredibly good at a, at a game that you love, right? Where it's, uh, you become a fan uh, of certain players. Then you also have to look at this in the context of the, the video game industry a little bit. So there's a, um, 
even really before eSwords was emerging, there was this concentration of video games that, that, that was happening. So the major publishers are becoming less interested in developing small experimental games. And they're much more interested in focusing on their big IP that makes a lot of money and putting more resources into those to make those games uh, much richer environments, larger worlds, more game modes, uh, uh, more features. So we have that, that, that concept. And then eSports is really reinforcing that and making that even more extreme uh, because you're making certain games really hit the stratosphere as far as popularity goes, um, where you're seeing uh, people coming in, celebrities as far as being so good at particular sports. So we're seeing a lot of concentration uh, in terms of uh, particular IP making a lot of money and indie developers struggling a, a lot more because it's, it's much more difficult to break through and the big publishers are not making very many experimental type games. They're really focusing on their IP that, that makes money. Uh, also the context, I'm sure everyone has heard of software as a service. Well, the game industry is doing the same thing, where it's going to be moving into um, uh, games as a service. So uh, Alex was talking about League of Legends being 10 years old. That's true, but it, it's just going to be continuously updated, where there isn't necessarily a release and then buy the next one. Um, if you're an NBA fan, maybe you buy NBA 2K every year, all right? And so every year it comes out and you throw down 80 bucks uh, for the new version. That eventually will probably go away, and it'll be more that you're paying um, uh, five dollars a month to 2K, and you have access to uh, NBA 2K, and they're just constantly keeping that thing up to date for you uh, on a regular basis. And there isn't a, a release of, of a new game anymore. Um, so, with that as the, the context, uh, you have this. Um, uh, publishers needing to take into account this new concept of spectators, right? So this, uh, all this backstory is, is related to um, putting all your resources into making an experience for a player, right? That's your ultimate goal. It's like, how do I make this fun for the player? But now there's this new thing of, wait, how do I make it fun for somebody watching, right? And that's really kind of a, a newer concept that the game designers are dealing with. Um, how do we make something uh, where the customer is not the player, the customer is a spectator? And then the business on top of that is even more complicated, is, is how do I make money on those eyeballs, right? Because why do I care about supporting that viewer if I don't make money ultimately on it? So we'll, we'll talk to those things uh, a little bit now. So has anyone, raise your hand if you played Madden NFL any time recently. Okay, got a handful. Okay, so you'll watch this and you won't be intimidated. But I'm expecting that if you don't play Madden NFL, this might be sort of an intimidating experience. So this is how you play Madden. This is the play call screen. This is somebody that knows what they're doing, that's going through the available options, uh, selected a play that they thought made sense for the, uh, the mode. So you have to know football and you have to understand the, uh, um, the game itself. But then when he went to the line of scrimmage, it's like a, it's sort of or something. Uh, you notice he probably hits he hits a hot key which showed the routes the wide receivers were going to run to and the key that you would have to hit to throw it to that particular person. You can do even excuse me, you can do even more advanced things like call audibles at the line of scrimmage and you can get as, as advanced as football is. So EA's motto for a long, EA Sports motto for a long time was if it's in the game it's in the game, right? So that's their focus is that hardcore export user that is really interested in, in learning all the um, how to play this game. That's not necessarily how people Coaches watch football, right? This is how you watch year, an NFL Ramirez, game if you're uh, just a fan of football. So you notice we're zooming in on a lot of individual players trying to get personalities. Do we then get a side view, right? Which is different from what Madden showed. Madden was behind you. Um, On third down now, the pass incomplete. And they were behind you for a particular reason, is that that would be the only way you could see all the routes, right, as they run down the field. When you're watching an NFL game, you'll notice that when the wide receiver gets about, I don't know, 10 yards, 15 yards down, you can't see where they're going anymore, right, unless it gets thrown to them, and then you can see where they happen to be. Um, because you don't care, okay, unless you're Rick. Rick seems like... He knows something about football. But for if you're a viewer like me, I don't really know what a slot. I don't, I'm just watching to see if you've got a touchdown or not, right, kind of thing. Um, and that's the, what the NFL has found is the best user experience. You, 
you might notice that they do have that camera that's like on a cord sometimes at the light, but it's not very popular, right? So they usually go away from it and, and go back to the side view that people uh, find more comfortable. So EA was aware of this, um, and they decided that they added a new feature into Madden called the spectator mode. And they actually hired cinematographers uh, that worked at the NFL to help them replicate how does the an, an NFL production work. So this is a game where they're, we are watching two other people play. We are a spectator in this game. So this is a, a mode that you can go into the, to the game where you're, you can say, I want to watch this game that's in progress and being played. And you'll notice we're having a camera angle that's much more uh, uh, similar to what an actual NFL game is. We're doing a lot of zoom in and cut scenes and it's trying to present itself much more like you would get from a, a presentation as if you were watching an NFL game. Uh, and this is going after uh, Rick, right? So this is going after him where he can watch this game, getting rid of all the user interface stuff that's confusing as far as the play calling screen. In addition, so I kind of mentioned before uh, uh, LAN support, local area network support. So that was kind of the, the dawn of, of online, or uh, not online, uh, of uh, multiplayer g gaming there. And it sort of went out of fashion, right? Because when we had online player uh, modes, it, everything was in essential servers that was managed by the, the game. So EA's server, you just have to be connected to the internet in order to play uh, multiplayer. So tournaments hate that. Right? So if you're in a big tournament, you don't want to rely on having a strong internet connection or have to deal with the EA server going down for maintenance in the middle of your tournament for some reason. Uh, so you want to be on your own uh, local area network. Also, it's going to be much lower latency, so like, you don't have to worry about any sort of uh, um, complaining about, we didn't, I didn't win because there was some sort of uh, internet problem. So actually... Um, Alex was talking about uh, StarCraft II. When it came out originally, it did not have LAN support. It was all just pure online. And the community had a huge backlash about, about wanting LAN support uh, back in the game, like it had in, in StarCraft. Uh, and they eventually, Blizzard had to give in and actually added support back for that. It was really sensitive. There we go. So this is uh, uh, my last slide here. Do most game publishers uh, care about esports? Uh, man, it is, that's, it's a very difficult uh, question. So the initial, I think, reaction from the typical uh, IP owners and publishers um, was, it's good, right? You want to support it, right? It, it's going to ultimately drive people to, to buy more of the games because um, it's going to make our game more popular. Um, I don't know if that's really borne out by data and, and it is actually true. You know, I watch the NFL, does it necessarily make me want to go play football? Maybe not. Uh, so there is a, I think, an interest now in the publishers of figuring out how to monetize directly, right? So how do we actually make uh, money on that? Um, so you're seeing Tencent and EA and Activision Blizzard starting to invest in their own tournaments. Um, is that a good idea? I don't know. It's very outside the ballpark of what they do as a business, so it, uh, we'll see. Um, you probably heard about that shooting at the uh, Madden competition in Jacksonville. So EA is doing these Madden competitions uh, uh, to get out there. And if you watch, they have the broadcast online, they look exactly as if you're watching NFL today, right? They have like a former, they have actual NFL players, uh, they have uh, actual um, uh, um, uh, Esports e gamers uh, in there, and, and they're kind of talking strategy and, and presenting it uh, very similar to what you would see on, on a given Sunday morning. Um, so it's a very open ended question that I don't have an answer to. Uh, they are definitely interested in it, but they're trying to figure out how to, uh, how, how to monetize it more directly um, because it is, like I was showing before, going to create a cause a significant investment on their side in order to support it properly. So you saw EA adding that spectator mode. Like if you, we saw some of the League of Legends um, videos previously, raise your hand if you play League of Legends. Okay, so for everybody else that made no sense to you, right? Like of, of what was going on, going on in that screen. So how do we take some of those, those games that are maybe uh, very complicated and make them still fun for uh, the non-players to enjoy watching and how do we make uh, money on it is, is the question that the, the publishers are dealing with. Some of this 
was already talked about, but um, just for a big overview of um, why esports is so important, it's the first global audience of literally anything in the world. I mean, soccer is a pretty global audience. Esports is a truly global audience. A, a title like League of Legends reaches everyone in the world. So you might, for soccer, maybe you've got, you know, MLS fans here, you know, different leagues, fans in Europe, you know, everybody's watching um, these esports tournaments. Streaming is, as we've heard, is really driving the market. And everybody's really trying to get into um, esports. So for game publishers, um, we were talking about League of Legends has been around for 10 years. I mean, that's a dream come true for a game publisher. You know, it used to be you'd go, you'd buy your game at the store for 60 bucks, you'd play it for about 40 hours, you'd be done. Maybe if it was a sandbox style or a sports game, you'd get a little more time out of it. You know, now this game has been around for 10 years and they're making a fortune. So you can imagine everybody's scrambling to put, you know, esports components into their games. They're also trying, each, all the publishers are trying to form their own leagues. Um, I believe the uh, buy-in for an Overwatch franchise is now about $2 million, is that right? I mean, it's, it's just incredible. Um, and uh, traditional sports franchises are trying to get into it too. They know that their audiences are getting older. They know that people are not watching um, broadcast TV as much anymore. So it's a way for them to reach a younger audience. The NBA especially is the most active in esports. Most of the NBA teams have got some kind of an investment in esports. They might own a team or they've heavily invested into a franchise. So it's probably good to watch what the um, NBA teams are doing. Um, <clears throat> and then all the media and technology companies, they're just investing in, in everything from teams to leagues to streaming tools. Um, you know, Amazon's big acquisition of Twitch a few years ago. And then another interesting thing to pay attention to with Twitch is, I don't know if you saw the um, broadcast of the NFL game? where they kind of had all of these different widgets layered on so you could track stats. They were trying to let you um, watch an NFL game the way that you would maybe watch an eSports game where you can kind of get all this deeper information. So that's something to, uh, you can probably see a stream of the way that they um, showed that if you weren't aware that that happened. And then brands, there's a billion dollar advertising market predicted um, our platform is currently in beta, and we actually already have several um, major brands who are getting involved with us that will be um, launch partners, because everybody is looking for a way to reach this valuable audience. Um, so game development, I'll talk about it a little more from a um, business side, because I'm obviously not a game developer. Um, the most important thing to I think to know about these esports titles is they're really driven by the community. So League of Legends didn't set out and say, we're going to make an esports title. You know, they developed a great game. People started playing it with teams, started independently organizing and playing it competitively, and it kind of grew organically. Um, you know, PUBG, the same thing. The community really adopted. CSGO, the community adopts it. So the community's got to adopt it and like it enough to want to organize and form teams. They want to like, they need to like it enough to build their skill level and play exclusively, you know, hours a day on this one game instead of trying a lot of different games. So it's really community driven. And you'll actually see with a lot of the tournaments, um, some of the purses are driven by the community too, where the fans are contributing to the prize purses that the teams and the competitors are getting, which is pretty different. Um, again, adding multiplayer modes, adding MOBA onto um, games that were previously single player, um, games as a service, and you'll also hear the term um, live operations. So instead of just shipping something, maybe sending out a few bug fixes, you've got your servers and your maintenance and your customer service and everything running, you know, 24 seven, because these are like living, you know, platforms that people are always on. And uh, PC and peripherals, it's been huge for um, the PC. My first job in the game industry was I was working for the Game Developers Conference. And 
at the time, everybody thought that the PC, that PC gaming was going away, the consoles were going to take over everything. And, um, you know, now people are wondering if this is the last generation of game consoles that's going to be released, which is um, a huge reversal, and it's really due to uh, eSports. And then you can imagine it's incredibly also incredibly valuable to people who are making keyboards, gaming chairs, you know, all kinds of gaming peripherals. Um, we were over with uh, clients at NVIDIA, and they were showing us um, all of these, uh, you know, their gaming system, and then they've got all of these new tools so that you could look at your game in 360 and kind of analyze later from every angle how you played it or share it with your friends like that or being able to capture a... Um, you know, capture a better video or capture a better image of your, um, of your gameplay. And then uh, mobile esports is actually, in Asia, there are now more people playing mobile esports than are playing um, PC esports. And actually about 50%, the biggest title is um, one called Honor of Kings. It's called Arena of Valor here. And about half of the players in Asia are um, women. So that's a, that's a big difference. So um, now I want to get into a little bit about China. I have some data from, a, from an analyst company called Nico Partners. They analyze data and the gaming industry in China and then also in Southeast Asia, which is the fastest growing um, games industry. Thailand is um, right now number one. Vietnam is uh, really up and coming, especially in mobile. But you, know, you look at all of these um, huge numbers and you can get these from a, a site called esc.watch. You see all these huge numbers. 95% of these people are in China. So you know that's just that's just astounding when you um, when you think about that. So China. Um, so in the U.S., we're paying a lot of attention to the industry in China, and it's for um, for a lot of different reasons. Part of the reason that it's so big in China was consoles were banned in China for. A long time. You just couldn't buy them. You could buy gray market consoles, but in a country where the um, average household income wasn't that high, it was really a luxury product. So, and people didn't have great PC gaming systems at home. They would go play in iCafes. So, you know, you can imagine that this is a great way for an esports culture to get started. Also, most of these games are free to play. And then, you know, you're spending in the game as you go along. Um, people in China will also happily pay for coaching or training to um, get better at the game. They're obsessed with um, moving up the levels. They'll actually sacrifice graphic quality for, you know, better gameplay and to move, um, to move up faster. They're very focused on competition there. So... The other thing about China is since esports has been so established, it's as mainstream there as traditional sports. So the top esports competitors in China are as well known as, you know, NBA or NFL athletes here. And the shoutcasters, which are the people who narrate these um, tournaments, either live or when they're streaming them, are also as well known as a lot of the sportscasters here. They're celebrities. Um, these shoutcasters make huge amounts of money. Um, the uh, st video streaming platforms in China are all competing with each other to number one, sign um, top streamers, and number two, sign um, top shoutcasters with exclusive contracts. So that's something we'll probably see here. All of these things are things that we'll see in the US. The trends are just happening um, a lot faster and on a much bigger scale in uh, Asia. So. The top, the top competitors are earning huge amounts of money. Um, the stream, streaming is at a gigantic scale. Tencent just made some pretty big investments in two different um, streaming platforms in China. One's Daoyu and one is Huya. And they're, they're planning IPOs. Tencent is another company. If you're not paying attention to, you probably should be. They actually own a lot of um, game companies or parts of game companies in the US. So for example, Riot Games, Tencent owns them. They let Riot, they, 
they're very like quiet with their brand. They let Riot, you know, pretty much run their own company, but um, they're there. So if you look them up, you'd actually be surprised um, at how much of the uh, U.S. games market they own or they control. Um, tournament prize pools are continuing to grow. The interesting thing is 20% uh, of that prize pool in Asia is now on um, mobile. And the franchising of leagues, so I mentioned that you know, Overwatch, these franchises are very expensive. They've been doing that for a long time in China. So there's been players that have been able to kind of have a steady, you know, steady living and not just kind of the top players. There's kind of a middle class of professional players that can make a living and, you know, play um, all the time. They have a lot of government support. Um, Esports is going to be a medal event in the next Asian Games. They did a test in the 2018 Games and it was really successful. There's talk about it being part of the Olympics. I, the IOC is actually pretty concerned about, you know, game violence. Um, they're going to need a little more choice than just the, uh, what's the game where you play soccer with trucks? What's that? Yeah, <laughs> Rocket League. They're going to need more choice than like just Rocket League to have that be viable. So I actually think that that's a uh, farther, um, farther away. And then education, um, Tencent had a tournament this year and 278 college teams signed up. So, you know, there are starting to be college teams here. Um, UC Irvine now has a program you can major actually in um, esports too, it's part of the curriculum. But, you know, 278 is just unbelievable. And then the other thing about um, China, which is why I wanted to, and all of Asia, which is why I wanted to show you the um, video of uh, Garena is that fan culture is um, really different than it is here. I don't know how many of you have been to like E3 or PAX or any of those, um, any of those game conferences. So, you know, there's a lot of fans there. They're pretty excited about things. If you go to um, Garena World in Thailand, it's a whole different story. Or um, I've been able to go to uh, China Joy quite a few times, and I think um, 175,000 people or something um, went this year. And it's gigantic, and there's these big screens, but there's the people aren't just like playing esports. So I was telling these guys, they'll have a rapper, or they'll have a band playing on stage, or they'll have like, you know, people dancing, and the shoutcasters are yelling the whole time. And, you know, there was one trailer that they were showing, and everybody was crying. Like, just the intensity of... Um, of these fans is just, and the passion is like nothing you've um, you've seen in the U.S. And I I think that I think that we'll get there in the U.S. So now going to um, investment in the U.S. So you'll see that it's following China um, a bit with the different trends that people are investing in, and you can see this is a uh, this is a chart from um, TechCrunch's Crunchbase. And investment in esports um, in the U.S. and startups, it's up a thousand percent or something over the last two years. It's just incredible, um, the money that's coming into it. And uh, so streaming, I mentioned Tencent investing into Huya and Daoyu. Um, the Korean esports network that you mentioned, ONG, just invested a hundred million into um, PUBG. And I believe they have the streaming rights, and they're also going to help start up um, a PUBG um, professional esports league. Mobile esports is um, another area that the publishers and investment is coming into. Um, PUBG has started up a uh, mobile tournament um, in the US. If you were at E3, you would have seen that um, Arena of Valor had a big stage set up and they had a uh, tournament going the, um, through the whole time and a lot of people, um, a lot of people watching it. And uh, Clash Royale is um, the uh, publisher of uh, Clash Royale. Is, Supercell is also heavily investing in, um, in their mobile tournaments. So esports stadiums and facilities, there's a... There are so many um, dedicated stadiums and uh, facilities in Asia. And part of it started out with the iCafe culture. And, you know, if, if you went into these years ago, they would just be a bunch of chairs, a bunch of screens. They weren't that nice inside. You go into the higher end ones now, and they're really optimized for esports. Some of them even have stages in there. They might have bars. They've 
all got like great chairs on the top of the line equipment and they're set up so that you could go and watch people in an esports match as well as um, as well as play yourself. You're starting to see some dedicated stadiums in the U.S. I think there's one, but there's still um, there's one that's a standalone now. But most of them are part of other stadiums where they might have a they might have a separate room for you know esports for a smaller tournament, or they might kind of convert the big floor into um, an esports tournament. But there is investment in um, in uh, standalone facilities in the U.S. Um, Leagues and teams, Cloud9, I think, just took in um, $50 million. Um, there was another one that I think just announced this week that took in um, $15 million. And when you're talking about these uh, teams, it's not just a single team that's getting invested in. So somebody like a Cloud9 or a Dignitas has multiple teams at different levels with with different games. So they're not just, it's not just like a League of Legends franchise. They'll have a League of Legends team. They'll have a CSGO team. You know, they'll have a, you know, they'll have a team for all of the, uh, all of the big titles that they're supporting. And um, the other thing that is really uh, sponsorable by brands are the houses where these esports athletes are going and um, training. So they'll put all these players in a house together with their coach so that they can train, you know, all day and so you could imagine that a you know PC manufacturer wants to get their computers in there you know a chair manufacturer will donate all the chairs I mean all of these sponsors are you know they're sponsoring their sleeves they're sponsoring their jerseys and then the other interesting thing about these houses is um, a lot of sports nutrition companies are getting into uh, sponsoring this so there's a huge um, there might be the stereotype of these, you know, of these like skinny pale gamers that all they do is play games, but actually the top gamers are really, um, they're really physically fit. They're working out, they're um, very focused on their nutrition. I mean, they have to be, um, they have to really like take care of themselves physically to uh, play at the level that they're um, playing at. And in fact, the co-founder of ReadyUp, who is a former um, competitor, was also a varsity athlete in high school. And he ran five miles a day, you know, while he was training for um, esports, and you know, wouldn't doesn't drink caffeine when he's competing, and um, you know, and things like that. So their um, their physical condition is very much on their mind, which is then on the mind of um, sponsors. And then um, college and high school teams, leagues, curriculum. Um, NACE is a big. Um, a big organization at the college level. Um, there's another startup called Play Versus, and they're organizing um, leagues for high schools. And they just took in uh, 15 million dollars. <throat> so you know, every kind of at every level, the uh, you're seeing the infrastructure grow to um, you know, kind of the infrastructure that you'll see with uh, traditional sports. So um, infrastructure and tools are where. Um, where uh, my startup plays. So we, um, our group that founded this, um, one of the founders is uh, Jonathan Wendell, or Fatality, who um, is, was the first competitive um, esports player. And he's actually gonna be inducted into the uh, esports hall of fame in a couple months. So that's, that's pretty awesome. And then um, we also know Fatality, a few of us were at IGN and we had worked on um, a competitive league a competitive gaming league years ago that he was involved with. Um, and his vision was always to create a platform where anyone who wanted to compete, you know, could get into the um, industry. So the parts of ReadyUp are meet, compete, and get better. And meet is finding or forming teams. Teams can recruit and find players. Players can find teams. People can find each other and organize. Um, compatibility will, as people tell us more about themselves, we'll be able to match people that they have things in common with. So, you know, as a player, you're about more than your skill level and the game that you play. You might have a certain play style that you like. Um, you might like to uh, get in there and really like trash talk everybody, or you might not like that. So if you find people that kind of have your similar gaming like values, you will be able to, um, you know, you'll be able to kind of form a team and stay with them a lot longer. 
and then compete. Is that, this was actually the product that we started with. Um, it's just a suite of team management tools, scheduling calendars. This was what um, the first kind of thing in the industry that we thought we could fill. And as we started um, talking to all of the different advisors and uh, players that we were working with, they said actually one of the hardest things that um, you know that we have to do is you know trying to find other people to play with and stay together. And guys were telling us that they were like bouncing around to you know a lot of different teams. So we added um, so we added the meat component. Then the uh, get better was another thing that came from what um, gamers were telling us is you know, they wanted a way to find someone to give them coaching services, or if they were really expert, they wanted to be able to, you know, offer coaching services or sell skins, or, you know, we've got guys who do things like design logos for teams, and they, you know, they design websites for teams and do things like that. So the marketplace will match, um, you know, all of those people together. And of course, our sponsors already are having ideas like, what if we get this NBA player together with this pro gamer and then we, you know, sponsor that and then we offer that for, you know, people to play. So that's what that's about. And interestingly, um, when we were, so we just completed a seed round of about $2 million and then we're fundraising a little bit more and then we'll be doing a um, Series A at the, um, in a Q1 of next year. The platform's in beta right now, so we've got um, we've got players in there, and we're just kind of gradually growing it as we're you know testing out all the features and making sure that they're working. Um, when we were first talking to investors, they actually were more excited about the uh, meet than about the uh, compete because they saw that that was a lot more potential for scale because there's a lot more people who just want to find other players then are maybe going to organize a team or use a, you know, use a marketplace. So that was the thing that, um, you know, that investors saw was kind of the biggest um, runway into the mass market. The other thing that they, um, that they liked was, you know, if you've got a platform and, you know, I've, I've sort of had this at other media companies too. I was at IGN for a long time and, um, you know, if the industry rises, like your platform rises, you're not sort of dependent on a single title or a single team um, for how you're doing. So that was another thing that um, you know investors were telling us that they liked. And then they also liked the um, the network effect of if you're managing a team, you know we get that user, but then you also get you know however other many people are on the roster for that game. So you know you might have. 10 people on your roster. Some of these teams have got more than uh, 50 people on their roster because they've, they're constantly cycling people in and out depending on you know, their avail avail availability or who they need for a tournament. And then um, the other thing that, you know, that I've sort of seen with a lot of the startups is a lot of the um, investors are looking more at the team. They sort of feel like if you've got the right team in place, um, they're investing in the team and they're, they trust that you're gonna you know, build what you, know, what you say you're gonna build. So the, um, the team was almost more important to some investors than the product. And then um, actually the other investors were um, something that's been really, been really helping us get more investors. So there's kind of a network effect with um, investors if they see that um, you've got people who are going to be valuable to growing your business. So, you know, we've got strategics in, you know, gaming, finance, blockchain, traditional sports. You know, they like to see that because those people are going to add value. And then they also, you know, the investors all network and they add value to each other. So one of our, um, one of our investors that just came on board came on board because he said we had a murderer's row of, um, you know, people in gaming. So that was something that, um, that, that was something that was totally, um, totally unexpected. But, you know, so these are some of the reasons that we're seeing, um, you know, any, uh, any company get funded. But. I, I want to pose one question to the panel, and then we'll open it up to the audience um, for, for any additional. And, uh, you know, and, I don't know much about gaming, right? So I'm, I'm just really intrigued with the space and what's going on, momentum, and the, you know, the potential scope of this phenomenon in the US. And in doing research and prep for this the event, I found a recent LA Times story um, 
in which, the, and I wrote this down because it's too long, the, the owner of the LA Times, Dr. Patrick Soon Cheung, was recently quoted saying, the most evolved engagement engine is video gaming, Fortnite. The millennials across Twitch interconnect and communicate. He continued on saying, and I, I paraphrase here, that he's, he recognized video games and esports as being central to the evolution of modern news media. And he qualified that by saying that the, the Times is expanding its esports coverage in its sports page and, and wants to leverage this and investment in other digital platforms to shore up the Times position with millennials and sports fans across the nation. So to the panel, and I guess I'll go to you first, Alex, um, to the point of uh, video games and esports being central to the evolution of modern news media. Yeah, Agree, I, disagree, what's, what's your comment on that? Absolutely. Um, I, I think you know, whenever I try and talk about, uh, about esports or, or spectator gaming, the, uh, the point I try and drive home to people is that um, you know, this is a, a media phenomenon that grows out of a number of threads that are, that are kind of coming together. And so the sort of the, the maturation of the, of the games industry, but the sort of the, um, the, the move towards the sort of the consumption of more and more media online and through these streaming platforms. Um, but it also anticipates all of these, you know, different ways that people will will consume and, and pay for their media. And so, so eSports is particularly fascinating because it's, you know, it's driven not by advertising in a traditional sense. I mean, that's a, that's a, a component of it, but, uh, but at the same time, it's also this sort of this patron economy or this platform economy where people are, uh, are investing because they're, you know, they're, they're interested and they're donating to individual players or, or teams. Um, it's also an, uh, an attention economy that um, kind of drives this, this fan practice back towards the games. Um, and so I think it's, you know, beyond the sort of the realm of, of esports as this sort of this, this crystallized sort of insular media ph phenomenon, um, I think it anticipates the ways that people connect with media and, um, and sort of in, engage with, with media platforms in in the contemporary moment, and it, it you know it goes way beyond sort of um, selling you know products at, at you know intervals and in sports sports broadcasts or something. It's you know it's all of these ways for people to uh, to invest in in media in a way that feels more sort of personal and more more complete. And so I think that's what makes it kind of this um, you know this this really kind of ripe engagement that's, you know, that, that has a lot of kind of kinks to be worked out and, and, um, and you know, and things to kind of get, you know, get tested and, um, you know, there's, there's a lot of room for it to grow. I think it's, you know, the, the demographics are, are, are something that, you know, I, I think needs to be considered. It, it's an, that it reaches 80%, you know, of, this audience is 80 percent men. And so going really back young. to the, the cord cutters and, and uh, post TV sort of millennial. Market, yeah, I think it, it, they're, they're, as a publisher, as a traditional news media publisher, you're looking to tap into that social connectivity and the expansion. I think it's it's young and socially connected, but I think it also has a lot of like growing up to do. Yeah. Got it. Andrew, Jen, no. <laughs> <laughs> Well, Too deep, right, I know. Yeah, no, I mean, it, it is kind of a big question, but it sort of brought to mind a couple of things. Um, you know, first, when people are, you know, gaming, they're not only on one platform. So, like, a couple of the guys on our team, including Jonathan, are, you know, competing and streaming all the time. And, um, you know, while they're competing and while they're streaming, we'll be sitting there, you know, chatting them on Twitch and just trashing them, or we'll be in, you know, we'll be in on Discord and just, you know, kind of having a whole little separate conversation there. So you're really talking across, um, you know, three things instead of just one. And then, and it's all of us that are watching, like we're not even playing, we're just, you know, making fun of something he said or, and then another thing that is, um, I guess it's not directly esports, but I don't know if you were paying attention to um, 
the Google Stream stuff or the uh, Microsoft xCloud. So they're sort of doing, let's say, a Netflix model for games. So like on Google Stream, the test was with a game called Assassin's Creed that normally you need a console to play. So you can just stream and you know, play this through, <clears throat> through Google. And you know, Microsoft, is uh, they said they're launching um, xCloud sometime next year. But that's going to be, um, I, I honestly think that those two announcements are, will turn out to be the most um, important announcements of the year. But, you know, so now think if everybody's, you know, getting this media through, um, you know, through a Netflix model. Like think how powerful, you know, Netflix has become with, um, you know, with what they're doing and, you know, Amazon, you know, trying to catch up. So those were the, those were the couple things that I thought of. Yeah, interesting. So it'll be Stay tuned as uh, we see this evolve. Um, I have more questions, but I wanna, don't want to shortchange the audience. Um, I think we, if we need mics, we might have some floating around. The, it, the Angel jersey? All right. We could hear you. <laughs> Well, that was actually when we were talking to a lot of um, competitors, you know, because we talked to pros, we talked to, you know, college, um, college team players, we talked to just weekend players, and toxicity was a thing that came up all the time, which was why we also decided to make a foray into uh, matchmaking. And one of the things that we... Um, that we're sort of designing the machine learning around is this idea of kind of what your personality is like, because I don't know that you're going to eliminate the toxic, all the toxicity. If those people can all go find each other and, you know, play together, <coughs> like, and cause that might be your thing. Um, and, and if that's not what you want, you know, you can avoid it. And then I also have kind of a, um, different because you know I, I don't like it either but I have a kind of a different perspective on it and it was when I was kind of early on in um, the game industry I knew a uh, game developer whose son had um, MS and video games were a huge outlet for him and he was a player killer he would just go in and just grief everybody and blast the crap out of him and was just a total dick but it was a huge um, you know, it was a huge outlet for them. So I think if you can kind of, you know, if you can sort of connect the people that want that, let the people that don't want that, you know, avoid it, you know, I don't know how you completely get rid of it. I mean, I know that's a huge challenge that all of the, um, you know, all of the platforms are going for, but, you know, that do it doesn't necessarily, you know, spread into real life. Sometimes it's just a, you know, an outlet for people and maybe that's a better outlet for them to express that than, you know, at school in, you know, in real life. <laughs> so 
Yeah. I think there's this, you know, the, sort of the nature of games is that they, they, you know, kind of create this space apart or this like place where you can kind of do these, you know, imaginary things. And the, the way that they've been marketed, um, you know, is kind of about the sort of the agency of the player and about this kind of complete expression of yourself. And I think that's, you know, that's kind of what the sort of the, the culture of, of esports or, or video game celebrities is, um, you know, is is about at a certain level, not toxicity, but about the sort of these video games as a, as, a, as a way to sort of bring something out of yourself. And I think that that's something that, that platforms are kind of struggling with. I mean, you see the sort of the, um, the policing of like PewDiePie and, and his kind of performance um, as a sort of, you know, as this brand ambassador for YouTube, it, you know, it, it then kind of gets, gets reined in. And I think it's, it's going to be this sort of this back and forth between a kind of a, a very sort of um, do anything, be anyone, you know, it's a game, and, you know, video games kind of having to, to sort of situate themselves in the broader, you know, media space. And I think as more money comes into it, um, it will also moderate because, you know, you see professional athletes and most of those teams expect um, a certain code of conduct. You know, they don't want videos of people, you know, beating their wife on the elevator like that's you know and those players get fined for it they lose their careers I mean as these people want to rise through the professional ranks um, you know you'll see them you'll see these organizations have a code of conduct for um, you know for these young men and women and also you know they'll lose their sponsors or you know their teams will lose their sponsors so you know I, I think that um, I think as it becomes more you know more of a public kind of mass phenomenon you know, you'll see, you'll see it change. Hey guys, my name is uh, Sergey. Um, first of all, I want to thank you for this event being put on by MIT. It's awesome as always. Been coming on and off since 2000, so I've been here for like 18 years, I guess. Uh, James did a good, touched a good point. Um, my question is about something else, but I'm actually a Dota player myself. Go Dota, right? But it was like number five on Andrew's list, but it's actually biggest pr prize pool this year. It's like 25 million dollars. FYI, the company that is running the, this keeps three quarters of the money, so they made something like 75 plus million, and the price is actually more like 100 million. So they kept 75, and they gave out like 25 million as the prize money. But we're not talking about the money, we're talking about the next step. And then the question I have, which kind of Andrew started touching upon, and you guys all touched upon, is uh, esports and e-leagues is you know, competitive like we have in the physical world. We have these NBA stars, Michael Jordan, whatever, whatnot, right? But um, Majority of people who are watching this and also playing, first of all, for moderation, you probably it's up to the companies to moderate that because they're nobody. They're just you know, hopping on and trashing and, and doing that. But, but what I'm thinking about, and the question is more in direction of the next layer of money making, right? And it's the celebrities. It's people who are maybe not competing and maybe are not even that good at it, but they're YouTubers, they're streamers on Twitch. They're people who are personalities. And I wanted to maybe get more of an opinion from each one of you guys on those celebrities. So we're not, not competitive level, which takes 18 hours a day of practice since you're born until you're 16 when you're still clicking fast. But the guys who are actually commenting, they're out there making fun comments, making it fun for people to, to be the commentators and so forth. Yeah, I mean, there's a lot of very successful uh, video bloggers, I think they're generally called uh, on YouTube and, and, and Twitch and so on, and that make a healthy amount of money. I mean, since Twitch and YouTube, their business model is to uh, give back based upon the, the number uh, of subscribers you have. Um, yeah, there are some that have, you know, had that breakout success that aren't necessarily great at the games that they're playing, but uh, like you said, are interesting personalities and provide some sort of interesting commentary that enough people watch that, uh, that they get feedback on, yeah. In Asia, a lot of the shoutcasters um, make more than the players. And the first gaming conference I went to in Asia um, years ago, there were huge lines for um, autographs. And there, the lines for the um, shoutcasters were bigger than the lines for the uh, top players. So, and they're... Um, all, there's a lot more popular streaming platforms in Asia. They're all the top ones are all competing to um, sign, you know, shoutcasters and the top streamers for like exclusives to only stream on their platform. 
And as you start to see, you know, more streaming platforms um, come up here, you'll uh, you'll see that. So one of the guys on our team is um, he's a uh, Xbox um, an Xbox streamer, and Facebook actually just signed him to exclusively stream on um, you know Facebook instead of uh, Twitch. So you'll you know you'll start to see that. I, th I think. Um... I mean, the, the sort of the idea of this, this you know, sort of celebrity gamer um, is is part of like this bigger sort of micro celebrity movement. And so there's, uh, I think it kind of it gets to this broader point as well is that there's, you know, there's a lot of, um, there's a lot of uncertainty, but a lot of sort of money floating around. And there's a, this sort of diversity of, of pipelines that sort of get it into there. So you have advertisers, but you also have these sort of patron economies where users are, are donating to people that they like or, um, you know, or, or paying to have their message read out over a stream or something like that. And so, um, so I think that, you know, there, there's this, this kind of trend in that direction, and it has to do with the sort of the, uh, the segmenting of media. And so, you know, instead of having, you know, 50 cable channels to, to choose from 10 years ago, you now have, you know, a, a couple hundred thousand Twitch streamers or YouTubers to, to select from, and you, you form these sort of these deep, deep relationships with them. And so that's really what's driving the sort of the Twitch model, uh, is these sort of these deep user relationships with, with individual media producers who, um, the, you know, for, for some of whom the sort of the toxicity is a, um, you know, is a, is a boon. So, uh, you know, it's this, this sort of segmenting and siloing and, um, and radical diversification of the, the marketplace that these people are, are participating in. So I want to dive in for one sec. So a successful streamer on Twitch, how many viewers, like I, on average or at any given time, is considered successful? It really depends. I um, I was doing these participant interviews for, for the research that I, I do, and I was talking to this guy who was reaching consistently like 3,000 people would be watching him. Um, and he was making... Uh, half a million dollars a year just from their donations and, and subscriptions and gift money and stuff. You know, so that's a, for an individual, that's a significant amount of money, especially, you know, kind of being a, a just a video game kind of nerd. It's his background, <laughs> you know. He was like, I worked at Starbucks. Some people then, might take exception to that. No, I, I, um, I. <laughs> either basket it, right? Yeah, that's me. But yeah. I, I didn't think to, you know, start a, the Twitch channel, you know. Um, so yeah, it's it's this, you know, it's it's a, a very small market for some of these people, but it's you know it's it's about these deep connections. So you guys talked a lot about esports on a global scale, but as far as local scenes go, because everything kind of starts from that grassroots. Uh, when I think of Santa Barbara and I mean the Central Coast in general. I think of kind of like a crossroads between NorCal, SoCal, Central California. Um, so I was wondering, as a person who runs an esports organization in Santa Barbara that is mildly successful, uh, I'd like to hear what your guys' thoughts are on kind of local scenes, how to build that grassroots, how to go out and you know get yourself into that global market that we were talking about. There's a lot of interest from. Uh from game developers, you know, in sort of in growing local and grassroots um, esports events or competitions. And you talked about you know these smaller Madden competitions. Um, I mean, I think that's the kind of the, the appeal of a lot of this is that it's you know it's user generated or participatory media, and so um, you know there's there's a lot of ways in, but it, you know. What's your what's the organization? Sorry, uh, it's Gold Coast Esports. Oh, cool. um, awesome. Primarily Santa Barbara based, but we do events from Ventura all the way to Slow, uh, Paso, Extended. Um, we play mostly Super Smash Bros, and so it's all land based. We get like you know fifty plus people in a room, and everyone just starts going at it until there's two people left. Uh, so, you know, as far as trying to expand that market goes, I guess is the context. Yeah. Um, we've we've seen uh, we've seen different groups um, do things like everything from you know inviting more like prominent players as a draw, or they might host um, different like regional teams. So you know if you're like a Central Coast organization, 
you know, maybe get connected with um, an organization someplace else in the country and then kind of host them here. And there are a lot of sponsors that are interested in kind of the, you know, smaller, um, you know, smaller community events like HP Omen, I know sponsors a lot of like, you'll see them sponsor a lot of the smaller events because, you know, Intel's kind of taken over, you know, all of the, um, all of the big events. But like, when we've seen, you know, when we've seen other organizations do this, it's they're sort of connecting with, um, you know, other groups around the country, either for hosting them in person or um, hosting it online. And the other cool thing that we're kind of seeing um, across the country is organizations are starting to want to develop like their local teams. So, you know, people will kind of have like, you've got all of your, you know, pro sports organizations are city based. Right, so you can kind of get like your central coast and your local loyalty, and then start kind of having a rivalry with, um, you know, a different part of the country. And I think we're going to see that um, more and more. I think Nintendo's famously ambivalent about their esports scene, which is the difficulty with Smash Brothers. Which, but which is funny because they recently created a Twitter account yeah. that is just all about promoting the esports side. Your hope is the new Smash game is maybe they'll get behind yeah. that. But you have a, a narrow. I mean, that's the the demographic question. I think is you know is is your your strength and also your, the room for growth around esports is you you know that's that's an appealing market to the to the right organization. Yeah, I would think in general. I mean, they're dealing with a uh, a retail business, so I would think. Typical retail marketing strategies would, would apply to get customers in the door. I just talking off, thinking off the top of my head, it's, it's possible that you could establish relationships with some developers uh, to see if it's possible that they might be interested in doing some uh, special events, especially with like beta versions that are coming out. If maybe you would uh, have a closed beta environment and be able to record data and to give them sort of feedback on it, almost like a quasi QA sort of thing. Most of the developers are big pain in the asses and won't do that because they'll be so worried about security. Uh, but I just thought off the top of my head, that might be something that might be interesting to... to yeah, we'd love to have you in our beta. I can help you get really in with d developers, too, if, if you just want the right person to talk to uh, about it. Thank you, guys. Appreciate it. All right. We have time for one more. Uh, go right here to Joe, my good friend. Yeah, no, we'll go to Joe right here. Thanks, Dave. And so, folks, I, I think the panel is going to stick around for a few minutes after the, yeah. the program, too. Uh, first of all, thank you guys for, for coming. Um, you know, the, Andrew, one of your slides was the, the land party. And, you know, I, I was in high school doing land parties. So, like, the, you know, gaming has been a big part of my life on and off uh, and so on. And... One of the things th through all of the years of, of gaming that's been kind of a byproduct, but I think is absolutely probably one of the most important pieces to all of this puzzle is the friendships that you make. And, you know, through kind of the analogy for anyone that, that isn't a gamer, if you think about, go back to, you know, your high school, whether you were in football and, and, and cheer or one of those other things, that those, those four years of doing those team sports develop lifelong relationships. And, you know, some of my best friends, you know, I, I met through World of Warcraft and we've stayed in, in touch and, and throughout the years. And kind of picking back, piggybacking on a couple of these other thoughts, what I'm really curious about is when you go into Korea and China and, and you know, the, these areas where the esports has gotten a lot more popular, the U.S. is catching up, you know, how, how much traction, how, how, what part of the fan culture of the base are like junior high school teams, high school teams, and, and so on, and how much is that, have that, how much has that contributed to the popularity in those countries, and where is the U.S. and some of the more kind of Western countries, where are they in relationship to that? Um, in Asia, it, it can depend a little bit on the country. So, for example, in um, China, people aren't playing as heavily in high school because it's so competitive for them to sort of get into the next level of school that they're really spending all of their time studying. So you're seeing, you're seeing it younger, 
but what you're seeing the platforms curtail because it's all regulated by the government. So past it, they're requiring the, the um, games to say, you know, if you're 12 or under, you can only play this, you know, like an hour a day. If you're 12 to 18, you can play this many hours. So um, you're seeing most of the age group there, you know, college and uh, post, um, post college. And in the other countries, it's a lot more um, evenly distributed. But it, it's kind of it's kind of everybody, you know, there really, because if they're not, um, you know, if they're not playing it, and they might be kind of kind of the way it is here. You might be a weekend basketball player, or you might play at a men's league, you might play on a farm team, you might play in the NBA. You know, it's all organized. It, it's kind of the same thing there. Um, for you know, for every level, there's an organization. There's a you know, there's a way to step up and move. Um, move in. Um, so it's, it's really, it's really variable by, um, by country. They skew a little older in China. My favorite, uh, like anecdote from, I, I was in Korea for a, a month doing research. Um, and I went to this internet cafe, uh, and you'd see these like groups of, you know, five kids that would come in, they'd be like a five man league of legends team. And they would like come in and sit down at the, you know, the, computers as a group and like I'll be talking to each other um, and so I think you know that's like you know that element is there kind of kind of universally and that's I mean the reason I've played it so long is I've you know friends that have gone off in different directions and we still get together and you know play and so I think that's um, that that personal element is enabled by the kind of the you know these platforms for you know for connecting people and I think that's a that's a a big draw for the sort of the whole esports things is you know it's like creating these personalities you know so you have a relationship with your friends but you also then sort of know these esports celebrities like Fatality or you know um, I don't know Sneaky if you're a League of Legends fan or something or it's, you know it's, it's I think that element's still there. So to to add one point to that I mean I, I recently read. Uh, that there are 17 intercollegiate programs and some offering scholarships. So, and as you pointed out in your presentation, high schools are kind of, I don't know that there's a, a quantifiable number out there yet, but to your point, Joe, I mean, it is becoming cultural and, and uh, in, embedded in, in, uh, in our academics and whatnot. So that closes it out. Um, one, I'd like to thank you all for coming. Appreciate it. Um, you know, we're always pleased to see the community participating in our events.